now I have a, an interesting question to you, yeah? So, people have built, yeah, very big interferometers, yeah, to measure stellar diameters of stars, or even to retrieve, yeah, their intensity distribution. And, well, for instance, you know, you have the, the VLTI, yeah, well, VLTI for big telescope. And the star, yeah, well, are, well, many light years away, And let, let, let's assume that we look at Vega, yeah? Okay, we look at Vega. And uh, let, let's assume that Vega would be twice nearer to us, yeah? yeah? So only as the distance, yeah? Do you agree that to, to get to obtain the same information with an interferometer, we would need to build it, yeah? Twice smaller, yeah? Yeah? Because the angular resolution is, you know, lambda over B. So if the star is twice closer, it's twice smaller. So we need an interferometer twice smaller, yeah? Now, if we still bring it, you know, closer to us, yeah? So Vega at, let's say, 10 times closer, well, then we need, yeah? Still an interferometer 10 times smaller, yeah? Now let's bring Vega such that it is a sun, yeah? Okay? It's so near. What should be the size of our interferometer? For us to see fringes, yeah? And to use it as a practical instrument, yeah? To measure stellar diameters or to make anything you would like to. Could you try to, to think about what should be the size of that interferometer, yeah? So, well, just to, to help you, yeah? Well, I come back to the previous slide, or I can write it down here. We we saw that p pi times theta u d yeah, times r over lambda gets equal to zero, right? When this is equal to three point eight, correct? So we divide by pi, so it's 122, magic number. Well, now we measure, multiply by lambda. And now, well, what I leave, no, I let r here, and then I divide by theta ud, the angular diameter of the sun, yeah? And from that, you would get the value of r, the baseline between your two telescopes, yeah? So how much would you find? Do you have a pocket calculator? I'm just interested. Because if I give you the answer, yeah, you won't believe me. So I prefer you to tell me the answer. <laughs> okay. So lambda, let's assume that we, we observe, yeah, at 5,000 angstrom. Theta UD, yeah, we know that it is, well, 30 arc minutes. So, to get the result in second of arc, we would multiply it by 60, right? And then to, to have it in region, yeah, we have to divide it by 206, 265, yeah? This is a magic number, yeah? So it's the number of second of arc that you have in one region. So you have to make that calculation. Then you get the value of R in angstrom, yeah, in angstrom and you have to convert it in, maybe in microns, or in millimeters, or in meter. Yeah. But I would like to, to hear, yeah, what would be the separation between our two telescopes, yeah, for us to resolve the sun with a interferometer, yeah, interferometer, yeah. And this is a very nice practical work to do with students in high school or, or with the graduate students, yeah? Even to construct one, yeah? So 1.22 times the wavelength divided by theta ud, and then you get r. An interferometer, to use it, yeah? As uh, astronomers use to measure the angular <coughs> diameter of, of distant star, but apply it to the sun, you would need, yeah, to make a baseline of about 77 microns, yeah? Okay, now, is it possible? Yes, look. This was, uh, it, it was just uh, for our pleasure, yeah? It was in 2010, yeah? 
uh, we made uh, a micro interferometer where the baseline was 29.4. It means that the visibility is not zero. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the visibility curve, yeah, something like that, you remember. Mm -hmm. So this was 77 micron, yeah. So if you have a smaller baseline, well, you should observe fringes, yeah. And uh, where the size of the holes, yeah, was about, you see, 12 microns. <coughs> and uh, well, we just directed it, yeah, to the sun. And here are the fringes, yeah. So we just put, yeah, uh, this micro interferometer on top of the objective, yeah, of a photographic camera, yeah. And just put the camera on the sun, made a picture. And uh, well, the, here are the fringes of the sun. So this is probably the smallest, yeah. Interferometer that has ever been, been, been built, yeah? I have seen this expression or similar expressions where this factor of 1.22. Yes. So that means we are using the model where the star is uniformly, the, the intensity distribution. Yes, of course. But it is not, right? No, no, but the correction is small. Something similar to Gaussian or something, not the model. No, no, I would say you, you would use a Still a circular disk, yeah, with, but with a law of limb darkening. I mean, yeah, but we can't use the uniform intensity. No, no, I agree, yeah. But better than using a Gaussian distribution, yeah, you could use a limb darkening law, the one we know for the sun, yeah. And, well, it's not difficult, yeah, to implement that, yeah, yeah. Now, one, th one thing you, you, well, maybe it's too bright, yeah, we, well, I don't know, is, 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 there, is it possible to switch switch off the lights here you think well i will see it's not sufficient it's there too yeah, yeah do you want to switch all of them yes all of them it's okay it's going down well it doesn't make a big 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 difference but still what is interesting is that you see this is the fringe for n equals zero and this is n equal one n minus one and you see the dispersion of light. This is blue. This is green, red, etc. You see the dispersion of light, yeah? It's because here we are not worried. I didn't put set a filter in front of the camera. We work in white light, yeah? And well, it's what we expect, yeah? A dispersion, spectral dispersion of the fringes, yeah? Okay. Yeah? Maximum pixel brightness and medium of brightness. How to measure the visibility from this pattern? Yeah. Well, well, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make much sense because we are not in a narrow band. Yeah, you agree. Yeah. So what what we would need to do, yeah, really to measure the visibility, would be to disperse the, the fringes. To disperse. Yeah. So you would need a, a grism. Yeah. And then you would see the fringes as a function of wavelengths. Yeah. And then you could measure visibilities, yeah, yeah. But we, without uh, spectrally dispersing the light, it doesn't make much sense because everything what I've shown, yeah, is for quasi-monochromatic light, and this is white light, yeah. But le let's assume it is uh, quasi-monochromatic, yeah. Then what I would do, yeah, uh, we will see it during the next lesson next lecture probably or or the last one I, I i don't remember it's to model this yeah so this is a combination yeah of modeling an airy disk with fringes on top of it yeah superimposed yeah and we have a model for that yeah and then you would just just you would just use this image then fit the model with some parameters and you would derive the visibility yeah so it's possible yeah yeah. And that will keep the visibility for that separation. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now I come to the new section, yeah. Some examples of interferometers, yeah. So not micro interferometers, but real interferometers, yeah. So one of the most respected centuries of optical interferometry is located, yeah, well near Nice, yeah, in France, yeah. It's a plateau de Cossol. It's a very interesting place observatory yeah, to visit. Yeah? So the I2T in French, yeah, it's an interferometer with two telescopes. Yeah? We're made yeah, of two small telescopes, 26, 26 centimeters in diameter, and they were separated by a baseline up to 144 meters. Yeah? This was in 1975. Yeah? 
and uh, they were able to achieve an angular resolution of, you see, one milli arc seconds, yeah? For object brighter than limiting magnitude V equal to six, yeah? Now, excuse me? Why does the limiting magnitude come here? I mean, for such a small magnitude. Oh, V lim equals six. It's a bright magnitude, you agree? But it's because a small aperture, yeah? It's just 26 centimeter telescope, yeah? Okay. Now, this is an interferometer. You see here, telescope. So 26, 26 centimeter in diameter. And where they could uh, separate them, yeah, by up to 144 meters. And uh, here is a picture where the first ever obtained, yeah, with two independent telescopes, yeah, of the Vega, fringes on Vega. You see them very well, yeah. And this experiment, yeah, was made by uh, Antoine Laberry, yeah, who is still very active, yeah, uh, astronomer in his observatory. Of course, he's emerit today, Professor Emerit, but extremely active, yeah. The problem, yeah, the difficulty is the following one, yeah. Because of Earth's rotation, yeah? So, of course, yeah, the star is moving, and you have to follow the star with the two telescopes. But as you follow the stars, yeah, the difference between the two light paths is changing. So you need to use what is known as delay line, yeah? Optical delay lines. And on the next transparency, yeah, I show, yeah, well, <coughs> it's just a schematic, yeah, of how they look like, yeah? So, the baseline between the two telescopes yeah, is D. Now, when the telescopes yeah, are not at the, near the meridian, but they observe a side, you see that the baseline is not any longer D, but it's very easy. If theta yeah, is a zenith angle, this distance yeah, is D cos theta. Yeah? And theta is changing the function of time. It means that the baseline is constantly changing, yeah? So this is already interesting to know that due to the Earth's rotation, yeah, you are making UV measurements, yeah, at different frequencies, special frequencies, because D cos theta is changing as a function of time, yeah? So this is good, yeah? So we are, yeah, very fortunate that the Earth is turning, yeah? Okay, but now the light path differences between the two beams is also changing as a function of time, because you see, well, this is d times sine theta, yeah? d is baseline time sine of this angle, yeah? So when the two telescopes are in the meridian, yeah? Theta is equal to zero, yeah? So the light path difference is zero. But after it's changing, and it's changing very rapidly, yeah? So you should make sure that when the two wave groups, yeah? Come from each telescope, yeah? In the focal plane, that the difference in path lengths is less than the coherence, yeah, the length, coherence length, yeah, which is a few microns, yeah. So what people do, well, they do the following. You have here one optical delay line, a second optical delay line, and this optical delay line, yeah, may change as a function of time their position, yeah. So it's controlled by microcomputers, of course, yeah. This was probably the difficulty before 1975. You had no computers, yeah, to control, yeah, the motion of such delay lines, yeah. So what you see is that the difference in path lengths now is d times sine theta. So you see that you've had it that distance, yeah, along this path, yeah, to compensate. So that at the end, the difference between the two paths, so it means this one and, and I would say uh, this one are equal, yeah? Still zero, very near to zero, yeah? <laughs> so now let's look how many reflections, yeah? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, more than ten reflections, yeah? So of course efficiency yeah, is quite low, and this is one reason why you cannot observe very faint stars, yeah? It's because of the many reflections, yeah? And now, well, you have to make sure that during uh, the rotation of the Earth, yeah, these optical delay lines, yeah, are moved, yeah, but with a precision of the order of a, well, absolute precision better than one microns, yeah? Not easy to do. Why do we need this? 
Is this a good one? Oh, it's because uh, why do you need so many mirrors, you mean, yeah? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, well, this is a physiotype, yeah, interferometry, yeah? and you must make sure that the two stars, the two, the two images, yeah, uh, come on top of each other with the same orientation, because if you would have different orientation, and therefore you have so many mirrors, yeah? When you make a detailed, yeah? Optical, well, the, the design, yeah? You, you see that you need uh, so many mirrors, yeah? Well, th there are other types of interferometers, yeah? Known as, a, well, a hyper telescope, hyper telescope, and that, that one makes use of a spherical reference surface, and there you don't need uh, you don't even need one optical delay, delay line. It's just, just like the Arecibo type yeah? uh, telescope. Yeah? So there are different types, but this is how VLTI works. Yeah? You have even more mirrors with the VLTI it's in 13 or 14. Yeah? Yeah. Well, this is exactly yeah, the optical delay lines yeah, from the VLTI at ISO Paranal. So this is uh, one all those optical delay lines and moving yeah, along those rails yeah, with an extremely high precision. Another view is given here. And so there are mirrors there inside yeah, and the, the beams yeah, being reflected. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, here you have uh, two beams coming, one like that, going like that, and coming back. Yeah. So there are four mirrors, but for two beams. Okay. Well, after yeah, the small interferometer with two telescopes, yeah, uh, Anton Labéry yeah, built uh, GI2T, so Grand Interferometer with two telescopes, big interferometer with two telescopes. This were composed of, you see, two 1.5 meter telescopes, and uh, they could, in principle, yeah, be set two kilometers apart corresponding to a resolution of, you, you see, one-tenth of a mini arc second, down to limiting magnitude of 15, 17, yeah? And while this was around the year 80s, early 80s, yeah? And uh, Anton Labéry was the guy who proposed, yeah, to make a, well, bigger network with uh, larger telescopes, yeah? And this is how VLTI came up, yeah? It was thanks to his pioneering way, work, yeah? Now, we, we should uh, remember that he did that really alone, yeah, with a few grad students, you know, and uh, one or two postdocs, yeah. <laughs> so it was a really heroic work, yeah, to achieve uh, such nice results. I'm just curious, where are the telescopes here? Excuse me? I can't yeah. The now, the mirror is inside, yeah, this is a big uh, cement. This is a, a big uh, receptacle in cement, yeah. And it can rotate yeah, in azimuth yeah, and in altars. Yeah. He did that to avoid the propagation of vibrations. Yeah. Yeah. Then I know we, we've seen yeah, the third uh, telescope that has been constructed here, yeah, but it was never implemented because of well difficulties. Yeah. He had no engineer to do that. Yeah. He was uh, just doing it by himself. Yeah. Probably, <laughs> well, you know, difficulty. Okay, now, well, since the beginning of the 21st century, as you know, the modern sanctuary of stellar interferometry and aperture synthesis is the VLTI of ISO. And, uh, well, it consists, yeah, of uh, four very big telescopes, yeah, eight meters in diameter, so one, two, three, four. And there are four auxiliary telescopes, so smaller telescope, 1.8 meter size, yeah, which are here. One, two, three, four. The 80 auxiliary telescopes, yeah. And these were constructed by Amos, yeah, in the same company, uh, which constructed, yeah, the, the 3.6 meter DOT, yeah, the Devastal Optical Telescope, yeah. Also the, International Liquid Mirror Telescope. And now, well, I think uh, they, are, they are considered yeah, to upgrade the Ayuka telescope, yeah, the 2.5 meter telescope yeah, here. 
And uh, well, this company which constructed this four telescope is located at a distance of about 500 meters from our house. Yeah, so it's a company that yeah, we used to to visit and interact with. Yeah, yeah, but. Well, these small telescopes, yeah, they are really fantastic because they can be moved, yeah, along uh, this path, yeah, on the rails, and you can change their position within an hour, yeah. Well, you just need a handset, and uh, well, you move them as you wish. So you you are changing the baseline during the night if you want, yeah. So it's very really handy, and uh, it's probably uh, the small ones, yeah, telescopes with the highest technological. Density, yeah. So it's a uh, really, very, very accurate and a uh, very good uh, Why do you make design. It well, because it's the size of the plateau, unfortunately. Yeah. So you see, where well, the the biggest size that you could get, yeah, is two hundred meters. Yeah. Yeah. So they regret it. Yeah. They would have liked to go farther. Yeah. Well, Edmund Wilson. Yeah. I think they may go almost up to four hundred meters. Yeah. Which is better. Okay, so Shara now is another very performing interferometer. I won't review all the interferometers, but this one is also very interesting. Yeah, so it was installed on the historic observatory of Mount Wilson, where you remember Michelson and Pease, yeah, uh, mounted the seven-meter beam, yeah, on uh, the Hook telescope, yeah, and uh, well, it consists here of six, yeah, six telescopes. You see, one, two. Three, four, five, six. Now the, it works in the visible. Yeah, well, at ISO, VLTI works in, in the infrared. So typically 2.2 microns, yeah, rather than uh, at Mount Wilson, yeah, they work in the visible. So since the resolution, yeah, is a lambda over B, the baseline, since the wavelength, yeah, is much shorter, yeah, they get a better angular resolution. And also the fact that B, the baseline, can go up to almost 400 meters, yeah. So it's a very good machine, yeah. Now they have six telescopes, yeah. So how many, how many UV information can they recover when they make one observation? So you have six telescopes. So you combine one with two, one with three, one with four, one with six, two with three, two with four. So how many baselines? Fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. Six times five divided by two. Yeah. Fifteen UV data points, yeah, at the same time. And then you take advantage of the Earth's rotation. So here they are well finally getting uh, extremely good uh, UV coverage. And they can make a uh, well aperture synthesis. Yeah. Now, so it's mainly used for angular diameter measurement, but also for detection and characterization of tight binary stars, detection of exosodic clouds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah. And now, well, another famous yeah optical in infrared interferometer is a Keck interferometer, which is made of two 10 meter telescopes separated by a fixed baseline yeah, of 85 meter, and this is on top of Mauna Kea, yeah. And uh, it was mainly used yeah, as a nulling interferometry uh, machine. Yeah? So it means that instead of uh, well combining the two light beams, yeah, well uh, in uh, how, how to say yeah, positively in well in phase, yeah, they are just combining combining the two beams in opposite phase, yeah, which means that you are nulling the image coming from the star, and they are looking around it, yeah, if they don't find any companions, exosody, etc., etc., yeah. And it was, uh, well, mainly funded by NASA, so they did uh, their survey, and now they cut the funds, so I think it's not used any longer as an interferometer, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Now I come to the point of three important theorems, yeah, and uh, later on we will see some applications. Yeah. So the first theorem will be the fundamental theorem, and uh, you will see it's uh, something uh, very, very important yeah, uh, in optics. Then I will just remind you yeah, about the convolution theorem applied to interferometry. And finally, uh, the last one will be the wiener kinchin theorem. Yeah. So I will just start a little bit introducing the theorem, but I, I won't make the demonstration today, but the demonstration will begin tomorrow, yeah? But it's good, yeah, because then it will work 
in our minds during the night, yeah? And uh, maybe you will find the solution even when you wake up, yeah? So, when we previously established the relation between the structure of an extended celestial source and the visibility of the fringe, observed with an interferometer, we implicitly assume, you remember, that the size of the two apertures was infinitely small, yeah? And therefore, on the observer screen, what we were seeing was fringes, yeah? Not superimposed over an airy disk, yeah, but on the white, well, on the blackboard, yeah, it was uh, uniformly yeah, illuminated, yeah? So now we would like to remove that assumption and makes it, uh, you know, practical to assume that the two holes are not infinitely small, but infinite apertures, yeah? And, uh, well, the theorem we will demonstrate tomorrow, yeah, well, enables us to treat that problem very easily, yeah? Well, it's still about a Fourier optics, yeah? Now, use the fundamental theorem, logs one, to calculate the response function of an interferometer equipped with finite size apertures. Now, I just tell you what is a fundamental theorem, yeah? So, we will show that this theorem stipulates that given a converging optical system, yeah, like a telescope, like a photographic camera, like an interferometer, anything, you know, which is a op converging optical system, can be assimilated, yeah? So, okay, so for such a converging system, the complex amplitude distribution of the electromagnetic field radiation, yeah, in the focal plane is simply the Fourier transform of the complex amplitude distribution of the electromagnetic field in the pupil plane. Yeah? So, okay, it's a very simple result. Yeah, so it means that you have a complex optical interferometer. If you know, yeah, in the pupil plane of each of the telescope, yeah, what is the distribution of the complex amplitude yeah, of the radiation field, you may, by just applying a Fourier transform, determine what is the resulting distribution of the complex amplitude yeah, in the focal plane? Okay, now, in a more compact form, yeah, it's to say that APQ is the Fourier transform of AXY, where, you see, this is important, yeah, the coordinates P and Q are not the Cartesian coordinate X prime and Y prime of a point in the focal plane, but these, Cartesian coordinates divided by lambda, wavelength, and F, the effective focal length of your system. Okay. So, it's what I've said now. Now, the figure on the next slide, yeah? Well, we represent a convergent optical system with, a, well, two focal points, yeah? Well, the focal point uh, and then the two principal planes, yeah, as usual, now, in the case, uh, well, I would, go, I would go straight to the to this image, which is the most important one. Yeah. So what I have represented here, yeah, is a complex optical system defined by the two principal planes P and P prime, where the two principal points H and H prime, yeah, and then well, the focal point, yeah, in the focal plane, yeah, and here you could say well. This is also, also a focal point, yeah, but on the other side, yeah. So if you just uh, send a parallel beam of radiation, yeah, the rays would concentrate yeah, on that point, yeah. Now, H and H prime, yeah, would be the center of the lens if the lens was just a sing simple optical lens, okay? But here it's more complex. So you have these two distinct points, but they are characterized by the fact that, uh, I don't know if there is, uh, no, nothing straight here. So if you have a beam, so you see the, the beam here, H prime, yeah, goes to this point in the focal plane. It means that before here, the beam would be parallel and go like that. So this, this ray has the same direction as this one, yeah? And indeed, if uh, I had a simple optical lens, H and H prime, yeah, would be O, the center of the lens. And of course, this ray would not be deviated, yeah? Okay. Now, what we should remind, yeah, is that, well, you see that here all these rays yeah, are 
being focused here, which means that they come from a ray that is parallel to this one, to this one, and therefore this one is parallel, this one is parallel, okay? All those rays are parallel. Now, well, what you see here with the M uh, represented by the coordinate X and Y is a pupil entrance plane, yeah? So it's where I will define the distribution of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane, yeah? So this is a pupil plane with M being a re representative point, yeah? And this is a focal plane, yeah? With N being a representative point. And what we shall establish is that what is the relation between the distribution of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane and the one in the focal plane? Yeah. Now, I will just show you what are all the assumptions. All the hypotheses are the following. The optical system yeah, is free from any geometric aberration. Okay? Well, if it's not the case, we have a remedy. Yeah? But we simplify. Now, the edges of the diaphragm, so it means uh, the pupil, don't disturb the electromagnetic field. That is to say that the diaphragm behaves as a null or nothing function with respect to this field. Yeah? So it means that, you know, when you have the objective yeah, of a telescope or the mirror, yeah, anything inside yeah, is characterized yeah, by, uh, number one, light may go through. And if you are outside the diaphragm, it's zero. Very simple. So it's equivalent to assume that the wavelength of the light is small compared to the dimension of the collecting apertures. After third hypothesis, no disturbance other than those imposed by the optical system intervenes between the pupil and the focal plane. So we assume that uh, if we have lenses, they are perfectly transparent. If we have mirror, they are perfectly reflective. After fourth hypothesis, the light source is located at an infinite distance from the optical system and can thus be considered to be point light for the moment. Yeah? After we'll abandon that hypothesis, and this is where we'll make use of the convolution theorem. Hypos hypothesis number five, the disturbances yeah, occurring between the source and the pupil plane, so the source is very far away, are weak and have very, strong, uh, very long evolution times relative to the period of the radiation. Yeah? So the radiation is at optical wavelengths. Yeah? So we assume that, well, even if there is an atmosphere, and it is disturbed yeah, due to the atmosphere, well, this is with a typical um, response time of a millisecond. So it's much bigger than yeah, the period of the light. And uh, what we would do in that case, yeah, we would use adaptive optics yeah, to correct for that effect. Yeah? And finally, six hypotheses, yeah, the radiation is monochromatic yeah, and has a fixed polarized polarization plane. Yeah? <coughs> so these are all the assumptions. And so next, uh, tomorrow, what we will establish yeah, is what is the correspondence between the distribution of the ampli complex amplitude in the focal plane and that one in the pupil plane. Yeah? And the relation is very nice. Is this a Fourier transform? Yeah? So now the Fourier transform, yeah, we, we used it yeah, with a complex degree of mutual coherence. Yeah? So we are used at using it. And here we will use it again. Yeah? So it's, uh, it will be pleasant. Yeah? So we'll stop here. Yeah.